to each of you, thank you for joining us this morning. We are so happy that you are with us. There are those that are, uh, I won't say visiting, but you're usually here, but maybe the inclement weather has kept you at home this morning, and um, we miss you in our presence. Others of you may be visiting in a virtual way uh, by a conference call or by our video stream. We're happy that you are here as well. But each of you here in the auditorium, thank you for being present for our time of worship together. You might have run across signs like this as of late. Certainly it's a needed commodity, is it not? Peace. Peace. You know, I grew up with a lot of preaching that might be described as that's what it says and that's what it means. And there's nothing wrong with that kind of preaching for sure. You can do a lot worse and obscure what the Bible actually says. But it was not until my freshman year at Freed Hardeman. I remember very vividly a preacher's club meeting when I really began to appreciate the value of illustration. And the lesson that particular evening was on peace. And the illustration that was given, and I'm sure it's not changed since, was that in the roughly 5,000 years of recorded human history, all across the world, certainly including what the Bible teaches us, but even from other sources, we have roughly about 5,000 years of recorded human history a study was done on how many of those years were peaceful in all places. Now, I realize there are limits to studies like that, especially when you're dealing with ancient documents and trying to get an accurate uh, view of the information and make evaluation of it. But those that had studied this particular matter and devoted a great amount of time and effort and probably money also to their research, it was their conclusion that out of the 5,000 years of human history, there were less than 50 that were completely peaceful. And then they bumped it up to say less than 500 years when there was not at some place, at some point, somewhere on the globe, conflict. All that to say, that's a fancy way of saying less than 10% of human history has been peaceful. Now, you can debate that whether or not that's accurate. I'm in no position. I've not surveyed the vast amount of literature and history that those who conducted that study uh, did to reach that conclusion. But I tend to believe just in my brief period of life, and all of us, no matter how many years we've lived, it's been brief, you can remember numerous times when there was not peace. Not peace among the nations, not peace among co-workers, not peace among members of the family, not even members of the church sometimes. There is a lack of peace. Now, we could quantify that and say, well, we're peaceful. We're not taking up arms against each other, firing weapons at one another. So we have peace. Yes, that's one definition of peace, not an active sort of hostility, wishing to injure or harm another. And yet at the same time, isn't it true that real peace, the real genuine thing, the precious commodity that allows us to have a calm no matter our circumstances, well, that's something that's surely missing from our lives much of the time. And so we have symbols, and you see them there on screen, that are significant, that help us think about peace. Maybe the one in the middle, especially with the colors of the Ukrainian flag. And we're thinking about that region, and about that country, and about our brothers and sisters there, as well as those in Russia. And we know that they are greatly, uh, greatly desiring peace on this day and the days previous. And we pray that in the days to come, there will be a resolution of some sort where peace can again return. I invite you this morning to turn to Jeremiah chapter 6. And as you're turning to Jeremiah, it's an old book, yes, written roughly about 2,800 years ago from this morning. And it's tempting to say, well, something that old must not have anything to say to me today. It's relevance. Uh, it's not something that would have any application to my life. Or is it? Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, as he is often titled, was prophesying to God's people who were teetering on the brink of destruction as a nation, as a society, as the people of God. And his warning to them, 
is pertinent even this morning to us. And we could spend a long time scrutinizing his message and trying to draw out points of application. But this morning I cite but two verses, one in chapter 6 and one in chapter 8. And they read basically the same way. In Jeremiah chapter 6, the prophet says this in verse 14, They have also healed the herd of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Now turn the page, maybe two pages in your Bible, to chapter 8. This time, verse 11, the prophet says once more, For they have healed the herd of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. They've healed the herd of my people slightly, superficially. Let me give you a vivid illustration of that. Jeremy Manus was just a little older than I was. He decided to make some poor life choices and saw the fruit of those poor choices and decided it'd be better to live for the Lord. And he made his commitment to do that after a few years of doing otherwise. He and I worked together at the Bargerton Church of Christ as we built a new facility. He was skilled in HVAC, plumbing, and various things like that. And because he would not make fun of me like the older men did, I tend to work with him as we did construction on that new building, most of the male members joining in to try to erect it at, of course, a minimal cost. I developed a good friendship with Jeremy and loved him for the challenges that he had overcome in his life. One morning on the way to work at Procter & Gamble in Jackson, Tennessee, where Pringles potato chips are made, we think we're never even quite sure if a car in the opposite lane that was meeting him, if that individual had some sort of medical emergency, maybe reached down to pick up a cell phone or turn the radio station. It really matters little. Cross the yellow line and hit Jeremy's car head on. By the time I got to the hospital, Jeremy was semi-conscious. And his family informed me that he had suffered some serious internal injuries in his abdomen region. And it was surprising as I looked, maybe out of curiosity, yes, you could see, and I'm going to be graphic for you, you, you could see where there had been a laceration. But that laceration, that cut in his abdomen had been bandaged. And so it seemed as if he was cured. But you medical people, correct me if I'm wrong, it's been a while since anatomy and physiology, his superior mesenteric artery, the artery that exits the bottom chamber of the heart and supplies blood to the femoral arteries, that branches that goes down each of your legs, that mesenteric artery, even by that small wound, had been severed internally. And while the exterior wound had been bandaged, the interior wound could not, be, could not be cured, could not be corrected, fixed. And Jeremy, after even more than a gallon of blood was administered to try to stop the bleeding, doctors told him and his family there's no more that we could do, and he slowly lost consciousness and then eventually his life. A superficial wound, a slight laceration cut, or so it seemed, but you see there was something deeper that was the problem. And here Jeremiah looks at his people and his society. And I would tend to believe if he were among us this morning and we ask him to preach for us, maybe these same words would be his as he surveyed the American landscape and the landscape of our world. Peace, peace, that's what they say. But really, there's no peace. There's no peace because you're only healing the hurt slightly or superficially. Let me give you just three ways that's done very quickly and then notice some things where peace is proclaimed but not really found in today's world. Parents might pander to their children in order to get peace. All of us have done that. And maybe there's a time when it's appropriate uh, to give a toy or to offer a dessert or to do something, maybe just to get a little peace and quiet. 
Too often today we have raised and continue to watch, my generation included, uh, by the same methodology, allow children to rule themselves without discipline and correction. Just maintain peace, which just simply means let the child do whatever so the parent can do whatever they want to do. Peace, but really that's no peace and we're reaping the consequences of it. Some of you remember the day this picture was taken. And even today, regardless of what letter follows the name of the particular politician or the color of his or her tie, politicians promote prosperity. They give their protocols for peace, but really, of course, those are empty. Again, no matter their side of the aisle that they sit on. If you doubt that, go back to Luke chapter 19 and let me, as you're going there, just remind you I think you know this, but it needs to be said as we are currently looking at world events. It's cranked up again. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, the idea is that somehow biblical prophecy can be construed or interpreted to mean that world events are now unfolding that will eventually result in the return of Christ and the reestablishment of some earthly kingdom and how... Uh, both Old and New Testament passages are twisted and perverted to support this erroneous ideology, sometimes called dispensationalism, sometimes called dispensational premillennialism, whatever you wish to call it by. Here's what Jesus said in Luke 19, 41 and following. He drew near the city of Jerusalem. He wept over it. Verse 42, Jesus said, if you had known, listen to this, please. If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. What's Jesus talking about? He was going into the city of Jerusalem, and he had been identified as its Savior. In fact, if you look back to verse 37, the Bible says, as he goes down the Mount of Olives, in order to go then up again into the city, the multitude was rejoicing and praising God, and here's what they say in worship. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Yes, Jesus was the one and the only one that could come and bring them peace. And yet the religious leaders who should have gladly welcomed him will be the very ones who incite the crowd to tell Pilate, crucify him, crucify him. And indeed, in just a few short days, they would. But here, Jesus said, if you had known the things that make for peace. Today, America and Russia and China, the geopolitical favor or special status and how that relates to biblical prophecy, uh, according to some, is nonsense. I'll just say it as bluntly as that. Today, God has no special role for any special particular nation. I know for some people, they say, wait a minute, preacher. We're a Christian nation. We're the United States of America. Our founders believed in God. Yes, I know that. And I know we enjoyed his favor. And no doubt through uh, the years of our nation's founding and its independence and its growth, uh, the hand of God and his care for us has been seen. I don't doubt that for a moment. But I know that as he rules in the kingdoms of men, he exalts nations that are blessed by righteousness and submission to him. And he puts down nations who choose otherwise. And you don't have to watch very long the evening news reports to wonder which side of the scales our nation may be trending toward. So we enjoy his special status, not because we're members of any earthly country, but because we're members of his spiritual kingdom, the church. And so politicians that promote peace or prosperity or their policies related to uh, other things, that's not where true peace is found. True peace is not found in preachers who pollute the gospel. And maybe this is especially pertinent to what Jeremiah was telling the people of his day and would tell those of our day. The religious leaders in his day were responsible for the nation's destruction. Now, many people would consider that an overstatement. And probably those, if they were to hear that criticism and did hear uh, Jeremiah's criticism in his day, they, they rebuked him. They rebuffed that. In fact, they so hated him that they would eventually throw him into a pit. They would throw him into prison. Uh, they would even almost take opportunity to take his life. God protected him throughout all of that. They couldn't stand the truth. 
Jeremiah said the truth is you're just healing the people in a superficial way. You're just trying to make them feel good about themselves without addressing the root cause of the issue, which is their separation from God because of their sin, because of their wickedness, because of their iniquity. Now, this guy's easy to pick on. If you don't know who he is, I'll tell you later. But he's just kind of the face, sometimes of the movement called the Word of Faith movement. Sometimes it's called the Health and Wealth, the Prosperity Gospel movement. It, it goes by a lot of different terms. But he's just kind of an illustration of a lot of what has become of American Christianity. And here's my quotation marks. That's what it's called, but that's not what it is, at least by a biblical definition. There are those that say, for instance, in this particular movement, there's no such thing as sin. There's no need to call anyone a sinner or any behavior a sin because there's nothing that we have done that has offended a holy God. What he will say and others like him will say, you see, what we've done is just, is just we've fallen short of our potential. We've just really negatively done things that impact our health or well-being, physically or mentally, emotionally. It's really that some of my choices have diminished my ability to make wealth. And so thus I'm not happy. So instead of sin, it's just kind of a shortcoming in some of my own choices. And if I want to choose better, if I want to have a better outlook, it starts with me. And it's all about me. And once I decide to do a better me, to discover me and what I'm meant to be, then God will bless that. Folks, that's not what this book teaches. Word of God teaches that I'm a sinner. That I have, by my willful choice, rebelled against my God. Committing spiritual treason against Him, I've not only broken His heart, I've offended His holy nature. And because of that, I'm deserving of His wrath and His vengeance. But thanks be to God that even though I deserved that fate and that consequence, His Son Jesus stepped in my place, lived among men perfectly, and died on the cross. And by His blood and His life that was given on the cross, I can have my sins forgiven. And this holy God uh, that I have rebelled against offers to me still His love and mercy and grace, forgiveness through His Son Jesus who paid the penalty in my place. That's what the Bible teaches. But you see, peace is not found in polluting the gospel or making it about you or just how you find yourself. That's not it at all. Instead, uh, we have to understand that sin is something that condemns the soul. We'll separate one from God eternally. We'll condemn to hell. That's the plain fact. And that's why the gospel is about rescue and Jesus coming to rescue you and me and my need to submit and to obey him. Well, those are places where Jeremiah would say, peace, peace. That's what they say, but there's no peace there. Let me give you three or four ideas this morning where peace is not found. In addition to these that are so commonly put forward as opportunities to explore peace. Number one, peace is not found in a substance. We have to keep saying this because our world still has a problem with it. Peace is not found in a substance. What do you mean by that? Remember in 1 Peter 5 verse 8, that's where Peter uh, compares the devil to a roaring lion. He's walking about. If you've ever watched even your kitty cat in the backyard or watched a nature program uh, on TV about a lion in Africa, they do the same thing. They stalk and they walk in a prowling sort of fashion, very uh, stealth-like. And then when they see an opportunity, they pounce. Of course, Peter is saying the devil, he's walking about stealthily in the shadows. He's waiting to pounce when the opportunity presents. But you remember what Peter said at the beginning of that verse? Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Be sober. Well, we understand that term. Be free from intoxication, naturally. Be free from anything that would impact the body or mind and cause it not to think and act uh, in a, a proper way. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. 
Paul said it simply, Be not drunk with wine, in which is dissipation. I don't know how you can read verses like that and reach any other conclusion than the one that Scripture intended us to reach. Stay away from these things. Peace is not found in a substance. And yet it appears, and it happens often, that someone will say, but I have to have this, whatever substance it is, drug or alcohol. I have to have this substance in my life. That's where I find peace. That's where I find escape. Remember the wise man, Proverbs 20, verse 1, wine as a mocker, strong drink as a brawler, whoever is led astray by those who are not wise. Please look with me in Proverbs 23. I'm going to read it in its entirety, beginning in verse 29 to the end of the chapter. And yes, these words are now thousands of years old, but they're just as relevant as when they were, when the ink was drying on the page. Where do you find peace? Where do you find calm? How do you get through life? Many people try to find it in a, in a substance. And that's nothing new, lest we think it's a modern problem. The wise man said long ago, Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? That's verse 29, if I didn't state it for you. Proverbs 23, that was verse 29. Verse 30 continues, Those who linger long at the wine, those who go in search of mixed wine, do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. At the last, it bites like a serpent, stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things. Your heart will utter perverse things. You will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea or like one that lies at the top of the mast, saying, They have struck me, but I was not hurt. They have beaten me, but I did not feel it. When shall I awake that I may seek another drink? This is a man who does not have peace. This is a man who has believed the lie that in a substance he can find peace, he can find escape. Scripture tells us peace is not found there. Sometimes we do a good job warning our young people about these dangers, but it's a warning that all of us, regardless of our age, need to hear. Yes, young people, you need to hear that. Yes, you will be told by commercials, by your friends, by your peers, Maybe even by older family members or even, sadly, some that wear the name of Christ will say, well, sure, that's okay. A little bit won't hurt you. And yet this book, God's book, says peace will not be found in those things. The devil is just one who deceives, and he has deceived countless millions. And he's broken the hearts, not just of the individual himself or herself engaged in that activity, but those that their choices and decisions impact around them. Some of you know that pain very, very keenly this morning. And I know you hurt for those who have hurt you. But peace is not found in a substance. Number two, peace is not found in substance. Now you may say, oh, that's the same thing, isn't it? No, a little different here. Peace is not found in substance, that is, in what I have. Luke chapter 12 is maybe the case study. And we've referenced it often, but let's go back just once more and listen to Jesus describe a situation that's not that much different than probably one you and I could observe in our world today. Maybe that perhaps even sometimes in our own lives we have thought very similarly to this man. Does peace come from substance? That is what I have? Sometimes we think so. The ground of this rich man had yielded plentifully. He had a good year. In fact, his year was so good financially, he said, I've got to build additional barns to store all of the goods that I have. You may say, well, I'm not big into agriculture. I'm not farming preacher. I don't even have a flower garden. What's this mean to me? Again, you make the financial application. You got a bonus. Your salary was increased. Your investments uh, returned in the positive. Now, I know maybe uh, for many of us looking at the current economic situation, you'd say, well, this doesn't describe any of us. We still, like this man, sometimes make the mistake. Soul, you have many goods. You've got much substance. You've got financial security for many years. So take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. 
Here is a man who had peace of his own making. But that was a counterfeit peace. But, verse 20, God said to him with an exclamation mark, Fool. Yes, the word choice coming from the lips of God himself in heaven. This man, the only evaluation that could be made of the choices and conclusions he had reached from our all-knowing God was he was a fool. Fool. This night your soul will be required of you then. Then. Whose will these things be which you have provided? So, Jesus wants to make a point. I'm not that guy. You're not that guy. What's the point? Jesus said so. The point is, the same is true of he, the one, who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. There's a larger context that sometimes we overlook. We usually stop there, and I have many times in presenting this passage of Scripture. I need to keep going, and you do too. Verse 22, Then he said to his disciples, Therefore I say to you, do not worry. You see, we automatically, as I mentioned, we said, well, we're not the rich man, preacher. <laughs> I don't know what stock market you're looking at, but it's not going this direction, it's going this direction. You've been to the grocery store lately? Preacher, we don't have peace in substance. We may not have peace in substance, but what about in adversity? Can I have peace even if things aren't financially as I would like? Jesus continues, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat, your body about what you'll put on. Life is more than food, the body more than clothing. This, of course, parallels what he says in Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 25, to the end of that chapter, the Sermon on the Mount. If this is the same sermon, um, it's a little different, so I tend to believe this is another occasion when Jesus is going over some of the same material, maybe the Sermon on the Plain, as it is called. But the general thrust is very close, because Jesus said, look at the birds. God takes care of them. Look at the lilies and the beauty that they have. And the grass, God takes care of them. Why are you anxious? Now verse 30, here's where Luke again deviates a little bit from recording what Jesus by Matthew records in chapter 6. Luke chapter 12, verse 30, All these things the nations of the world seek after. Your Father knows that you need these things. In other words, that's what they seek in order to try and acquire peace, both individually and collectively. But you, verse 31, echoing Matthew 6, 33, Seek the kingdom of God. All these things shall be added to you. Do not fear, little flock. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So sell what you have. Don't even have a wallet that grows old, as it were. Don't worry about a moth breaking in, or a moth rather eating, or the thief breaking in to steal. You need to be ready. You need to be watching for your master's return. You need to just put your focus on the things that are eternal. Peace does not come from substance. Here's how Paul told Timothy to give warning in 1 Timothy chapter 6. In verse 17 beginning, the young man is instructed by the older preacher, command. Now that's a strong term. He's not telling Timothy, when you preach, just offer some general suggestions. And that's really what, in many places, preaching has turned into. Here are some general suggestions that you can take or leave as you will. Preaching the Word of God is different. There are mandates, there are directives, there are commands, and here are some of them. Command those who are rich. Well, he's not talking about me. Well, do the evaluation between then and now and see... What adjective better describes you, rich or poor? You know which one does. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, arrogant, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good. They may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Do good, rich in good works. Put treasure in heaven. Find your peace in those things, not in uncertain riches. Those things cannot satisfy.
Peace is not found in a substance. And peace is not found in substance. If you go back to Luke chapter 12, there's a curious question that I have, and it's not possible to answer it. I'll go ahead before I tell you what my question is. There's not an answer because Jesus doesn't give it, so it's only my speculation or yours if we were to try to answer. But here's my thought. This man, he kicks back. I can just imagine him in his lazy boy recliner saying, I've got it made. That's my mental image. I've got it made. And then God says, you're a fool, and tonight, tonight you're going to die. Have you ever thought about what amount of time would have elapsed between the Lord's pronouncement and His actual death? And do you think that in that intervening period of time, whether it be minutes or hours, that this man had any peace at all? Now, of course, that's not the thrust, that's not the principal idea that Jesus is exploring with us, but it's curious for me, at least, and I ponder, how much peace did he have in those last hours of his life? And while I do not know the answer to that question, I do know because I've observed and have watched many as they approach the end of their life, and I've seen it play out, as have you, people that put their trust only in what they had and what they had acquired. And contrast that with people who had put their trust in God and trusted Him to take care of them, no matter what. The difference in peace between the two individuals was remarkable. Peace is not found in a substance. It's not found in substance. It's not found in status. Not in status. Proverbs 27, verse 24, the wise man wisely tells his son, listen to him, he said, Riches are not forever. Well, that goes back to the previous point. It does. But then Solomon adds, nor does a crown endure to all generations. Riches are not forever. A crown does not endure to all generations. Again, in your Bible, go to the Old Testament and let's read together Psalm 49. Because we tend to think maybe, you know, status is something that's a modern concern. And we think of it as something, you know, that we have to, in this modern world, seek to attain. And we have to reach a certain, you know, level in society. It's interesting that Psalm 49, looking at that same idea, one author, commentator, said Psalm 49 might be correctly titled, The World's Empty Glory. The World's Empty Glory. Well, what is it? It relates to the previous point and ties into this one. There are 20 verses here, but just listen to them, please, and read with me. Hear this, O peoples, give ear all inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor together. So he's saying, everybody, this applies. No one's excluded. No matter how you may classify yourself. The psalmist continues, My mouth shall speak wisdom. The meditation of my heart shall give understanding. I'll incline my ear to a proverb, disclose my dark saying on the harp. Verse 5, Why should I fear in the days of evil when the iniquity at my heels surrounds me? Those who trust in their wealth and boast in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother nor give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their souls is costly and it shall cease forever that he should continue to live eternally and not see the pit, for he sees wise men die. Likewise, the fool and the senseless person perish and leave their wealth to others. Their inner thought is that their houses will last forever, their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. Nevertheless, man, though in honor, does not remain. He is like the beast that perish. Folks, this is relevant stuff. He's saying people then, just like people now, find their peace, find their satisfaction, find their confidence in life on what they have, what they do, what they're planning even on doing, what will live on after them, their peace in substance, their peace in status. Verse 13, this is the way of those who are foolish, it still is. And of their posterity who approve their sayings. This is an ancient problem and still today we have people who believe the exact same thing. Listen to this vivid way of illustrating. Like sheep 
they are laid in the grave. Death shall feed on them, the upright shall have dominion over them in the morning, and their beauty shall be consumed in the grave far from their dwelling. But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. There's where peace is found. Do not be afraid when one becomes rich, when the glory of his house is increased. For when he dies, he shall carry nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him. Though while he lives, he blesses himself. For men will praise you when you do well for yourself. He shall go to the generation of his fathers. They shall never see light. A man who is in honor yet does not understand is like the beasts that perish. Are you an animal this morning? It's kind of an insulting question, isn't it? But that's what the psalmist said. Are you just like an animal? Just trying to get all you can get? It used to be that you could see the little adage on a t-shirt. You know, he who dies with the most toys wins or some nonsense like that. Someone was wise enough then to produce a follow-up that says, He who dies with the most toys still dies. That's right. That's exactly what the psalmist is saying. So where do you find your peace? In a substance? In substance? Status? Selfishness? Certainly many people do, just in what I want, what I make of it myself. Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 6 as well in, as in Jeremiah 8, they say peace, peace, but there is no peace. This morning there is no peace in any of this. I don't know how to say it more clearly than that. There is peace only in one. And it's not the purpose of this lesson to explore that theme fully. Next week, the Lord willing, we're going to explore this in far greater detail. But I want to make one point and make it very clear and obvious. And I hope you leave this morning saying there is no peace in any of these things. There is false peace, but it's no true peace at all. There's only peace in the Savior. That's the only place it's found. I know that for a number of different reasons, as I said, that we'll explore in greater detail if He wills next Sunday morning. But I ask you to close by looking in Acts chapter 10. When Cornelius called for Peter. And Peter, as he had done on the day of Pentecost, preaches the gospel again, this time to a Gentile household. And in verse 36, here's what Peter says. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. I'm just lifting that out of his sermon. And you have to read the entirety of his sermon to understand what Peter is saying. He told Cornelius in his household in verse 34, God is impartial, shows no partiality. God will accept in every nation the one who works righteousness and fears Him. And the key component in that idea is the word of the gospel is peace through Jesus Christ who is Lord of all. And this morning, that's what we leave you with. You cannot find peace in a substance. You cannot find peace in substance. You cannot find peace in status. You cannot find peace in selfishness. If you are to find peace, you have to find it in the Savior, Jesus Christ the Lord. Now this morning, how you do that is understand He was, in fact, the Son of God who came to this earth and lived among us died in our place on the cross, defeated death. Three days later, his tomb, his grave was empty. And this morning, he offers to you life. He offers to you peace. Now, there is so much more to that wonderful offer than just what we can say in this 30 seconds of explanation. But if you want to know peace this morning, the only way you can know it is through Jesus. You may have something that you call peace, finding it in some other pursuit or some other desire or some other construct of your own making, but it's not true peace. Sooner or later, it will be revealed as faulty, as counterfeit. But if you want to know true peace, you can know it only in Jesus. And there are lots of people here that would love to tell you about it, myself included. We want you to believe in Jesus as the Son of God, to trust in Him, to turn away from living for selfishness. That's what repentance is, really. Just that acknowledgement. Instead of living for myself, I'm going to live for God. I'm going to change both my mind and my action. That's what Peter told those in Acts chapter 2 to do. People who had no peace, who had murdered God's Son on that day, said, What shall we do? Can we do anything? And Peter told them what we tell you this morning. Repent. Let every one of you 
be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ in order to receive the forgiveness of your sins. What would that do? What did that do? That brought them peace. What would it do this morning if you've not done that and you do that? It'd bring you peace. A peace that is better than any peace that anything the world offers by comparison, I assure you. This morning as a child of God, as a Christian, it's unfortunate, but nevertheless my observation that many of us go through life without peace. And it's not because the Lord doesn't offer it to us, it's because we don't accept it. It's not because the Lord hasn't made it abundantly clear uh, how we are to stand and live in it, it's because we just choose instead to hang on to our guilt or our fear or our worries instead of letting Him fill our minds and hearts and lives with peace. Maybe it's because sin is truly there. And this morning, please don't misunderstand. If as a Christian you're living and harboring peace in your life, you know that sin cannot coexist with that peace. But if you're trying to have both sin and peace of Jesus in your life as a Christian, that's not going to work. Those two don't go together. They don't mix. And so as a child of God this morning, if sin is keeping you from having the peace that Jesus offers, repent and pray. Don't hold on to it no matter what it is. It may give you a moment or two here and there of pleasure or joy, but it can't give you peace and you know it. Jesus can and Jesus desires to give that to us and give it to us always. And as His children, when we repent and pray, we have the peaceful assurance that He does forgive. What a wonderful blessing. Where is peace found? Only in the Savior. This morning, if you need to have that peace, then come to the Savior, even now as we stand and sing together.